Every year on my mother's side, well, every three years on my mother's side, we have a family reunion. And the family reunion always happens out in New Hampshire at the White Mountains. And it's a ski resort that we all go to, and it's in the summer, so we're not skiing. But uh, it's just a lovely place, and we always enjoy it. And there are just tons and tons of people who are there. And it's, it's a place where I have come to learn about a lot of my relatives that I didn't know before, having grown up in Indiana, and most of them growing up somewhere out on the East Coast. Well, about six years ago now, we went to a family reunion, and they're at the family reunion, there's a particular dinner that we always go, and the dinner is themed. And so you dress up as the theme, and uh, they have activities with the theme, and I don't really remember what the theme of this one was, to be honest. It might have been Disney, but I'm not sure. Anyways, this gentleman comes up to me as I'm in line to get food, and he's like, it has been so long since I've seen you. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> right? Remember when we used to go ice skating and da-da-da-da-da, and I'm like, in my head, no. I remember when you were in high school and da-da-da-da-da, and I'm like, I don't think you knew me when I was in high school. But do you know by this time, you don't want to embarrass the person, right? So you just, you just let them go. So I bet we talked 15 minutes. Literally, he talked 15 minutes. <laughs> as I sat there in my head going, I don't know who you are, and you really don't know who I am. And then somewhere it dawned on me, because he said, how... How is your sister and your brother doing? And I thought to myself, I don't have a brother. Who has a brother? Aha! He thinks I am my mother. <laughs> <clears throat> so I tell him about my uncle and my aunt and all that type stuff. We finally end the conversation. He goes. I finish getting my food. I go sit down, and my mother's here, and I say, Mom, you see that gentleman over there? He, and she's like, yeah, that's your second cousin, da 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 I said, you just had a wonderful conversation with him for about 15 minutes. <laughs> and that actually happens to us quite a bit. If you've seen my mother, you'll find out that she and I look very, very much alike. Very much alike. I couldn't disown her if I wanted to. And uh, she can't disown me if she wants to, poor thing. But some of us look so much like our parents, and some of you may be like that too. But sometimes we not only look like our parents physically, but sometimes we begin to look like our parents in our mannerisms and the word choice that we have and all those type things. Have you ever said something maybe to your child and go, oh my gosh, that was my mother who just spoke. You ever have that happen? Yeah. Or you're ever doing something and you look at yourself and you're like, that's my father doing that. I would never have done that. And, and there's just something about that. And the reason is because you grew up with them. You watched them do it year after year after year. And, and pretty soon after watching them for so long and being around them so long, you begin to start acting like them. Now, for some of you, I think you say, I saw that for so long, I'm going to do the exact opposite and I want to make sure to do the exact opposite. And that may be the case. Maybe that's what you learned by watching them. But the fact is, you still learned by watching them. You still learned because you were with them. So today, what I want to say is the same thing happens in your life of faith. Or at least it should. The more time we spend with God, the more our lives begin to reflect the things of God. And that's important for us to understand. And that's what our scripture this morning is all about. So I invite you to listen today from the book of 1 John, the third chapter, starting at verse 1 all the way through verse 7, and let us hear the word of the Lord. See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world, they don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. 
But we do know that we will be like him, for we shall see him as he really is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure as he is pure. Anyone who sins is breaking God's law, for all sin is contrary to the law of God. And you know that Jesus came to take away our sins, and there is no sin in him. Anyone who continues to live in him will not sin. But anyone who keeps on sinning does not know him or understand who he is. Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. So we're going to kind of work through this scripture today and see what it is that God would have for us. So the first part of the scripture simply says, see how very much our father loves us, for he calls us his children. Now I love this because what the author is talking about here is see how much the father loves us. Actually, see how much he loves us. How often do we take the time to literally stop and look at how much God loves us. And there are so many things around us to see how much God loves us. God has created this world and he has given us dominion over the earth. But he has created everything that is on it. That's one of the ways in which he shows us his love. And you don't see that any more than when you see it in spring, do you? with all the trees that are blooming, the flowers that are coming up, and the birds that are beginning to sing earlier and earlier in the morning, all the ways in which the Father loves us. But in this scripture, there's a special way in which God shows us how much he loves us. For in this scripture he says, for he calls us his children. Now that's pretty incredible. God loves us so much that he calls us his children. Now, we are not shocked when somebody goes out of their way to save somebody else. We're not shocked by that at all. Because there's something in us that when we see somebody in need, we want to reach out and we want to help them, right? So it doesn't shock us that God even reached out to us, even when we didn't deserve it, to show us his love by bringing us salvation. That's wonderful, but yet God went a step further. For God not only took a step out in terms of giving us his son Jesus to save us, but once he saved us, he called us his children. Once he saved us, he loved us so much, he decided to bring us into the family. Now that's a whole nother level. That's a whole nother level. It's one thing to save somebody, but generally once you save somebody, they thank you, you, you are excited by that, but then they go on in life. But God loved us so much that he not only saved us, he claimed us. He claimed us. He calls us his children. He calls us family. And here's the exciting part. He knows everything about you. Not only what you've done, but will, what you will do. And he still claims you. That's pretty exciting. That is love. God loves us. He claims us in spite of ourselves. That's love. And he wants us to see that. He wants us to understand the depth of God's love for us so much that he includes us in the family. And yet so often there are people in this world, even today, who have a hard time seeing and understanding the great love of God for every single one of us. Sometimes it's because of pride, sometimes unbelief, sometimes it just takes a great deal of time for us to understand the extent of God's love. But the author says, see, see how great the Father's love is for you. That he claims you, that he loves you, that he sent his son down for you, not only to save you, but to bring you into the family. That's huge. The scripture goes on and it says, but the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. Now, there's two things I want to say in this. First of all, who are God's children? 
There's two ways that you can look at this. Some will say, everybody born is a child of God. I do not agree with that. Here's what I will say. Everybody born has the opportunity to be a child of God. For Jesus came to save all people to include all people. Everybody has the opportunity. But what the author of 1 John is talking about is the people who are the children of God are the people who have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And although everybody has the opportunity to do that, not everybody has done that. So in this particular scripture, what we are talking about when we talk about the children of God are those who seek to live their life after Jesus. Those who have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Whether that was in a moment of time or whether that was a process through the course of time. But they have come to the realization that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. For those who have come to that realization, they are the children of God. And that is why the world does not recognize them. Because the world did not recognize Jesus. It was the world who said, give us Barabbas. Instead of saving Jesus. Because they could not understand the type of love. Radical love that Jesus showed. And that is what the world should be seeing in the children of God. That type of radical love. The love that goes beyond because that's the type of love that reached out to us and called us family, that claimed us in Jesus. And so that is the type of love that the children of God are to show to the world. Radical love. Love that goes beyond. A love that the world does not understand. Because the world will say, it's okay to love, but let's only go to this limit. But the love of God has no limit. And it continues to go further and further and further. So if we are the children of God, then therefore, as we spend more and more time with God, we should begin to look like him. Now, I'm not talking physical traits. I'm talking a lifestyle. The lifestyle of radical love. Because that's what this scripture is talking about. And the world will not recognize that. So here's what it comes down to. If we are a person that the world is saying, you are tremendous, you are fantastic, then there's probably something wrong. I mean, really. Because the type of radical love that Jesus showed, the world could not understand. They just couldn't understand it. They even said it was wrong. And that's the type of love that we are called to show. How do we define that? Well, Jesus said, love for everybody, including our enemies. And so how are we showing love even to the people, quite frankly, we disagree with? That we don't understand. Sometimes when I really want to get to know somebody, do you know where I go? their Facebook page. Because people will say one thing to me face to face. But if I go to somebody's Facebook page, most of the time I can really see who that person is. If you wanna really know who I am, go to my Facebook page. Although you know I already realized that, so I'm gonna make sure my Facebook page <laughs> shows who I am. Because there was one thing about Jesus more than anything else, and that is, and I've already shared with you, Jesus never lies. That is so important for us to understand. Jesus never lies. And one of the ways in which he lies is Jesus was the same to every person in every situation. And that's what Christians are called to be, the same throughout, loving in every situation and to every person. So if you can be loving in this respect and then your Facebook shows something totally else, I gotta go, wait a minute, something's wrong here. If we're face to face and I hear words of love, but then I see attack, attack, attack over here, then I'm beginning to wonder what's going on. Because I'm not seeing the same thing everywhere. Right? And so if we are the children of God, 
That means hopefully, little by little by little, our lives are beginning to change and reflect our heavenly parent in every situation, with every person. Does that mean that uh, therefore I have to change my opinions so that I agree with everybody? No, <laughs> you're not gonna agree with everybody. None of us are. But just because I disagree with somebody doesn't mean I need to hate them. Just because I disagree with somebody does not mean I should be able to attack them. No. And it's one thing to attack a concept. It's a whole nother to attack a person. You already know that. Dear friends, we are already God's children. But he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. Isn't that the truth? So what that means is that we are already God's children, but we have not fully evolved into everything that God wants us to be. So I want to slip in here a quick understanding of grace. You already know that there is one grace that is out there, only one. But we who are United Methodists understand that one grace in three ways. The first way, prevenient grace, the grace that goes before, the grace that is at work in our life before we are even aware of God's presence. John Wesley would have said, this is the grace that woos us into relationship. How many of you have been wooed? Okay, yes. Some of us literally have. This is God wooing us into relationship, reminding us of how much he desires to be with us. This is God saying, I want to be your papa. I want to be your mama. I want to be your heavenly parent. I want to be in relationship with you. I want to claim you. But then we have a part in that. It calls us to respond. Now, we who are united in Methodist, we understand that that response is called justifying grace. For it is in that moment that we are justified or made right with Jesus. That is the moment that we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We say, Lord, you have claimed me. I claim you. We have been made right. That moment we receive Jesus. In that moment, justifying grace is at work. And we have been made right a relationship aligns, we align. But that's just the beginning of the relationship. And, and this is what this scripture is talking about. This scripture goes on to the third type of grace. And that third type of grace is called sanctifying grace. Sanctified. You already know that word already sounds like a church word, doesn't sanctified. It simply be, means being made holy. And that's what happens in that relationship. The more that we spend time with Jesus, spend time in his word, spend time with other Christians who are also seeking after Christ, the more our life is changed into the life that Christ calls us to be. It is less of us and more of Jesus. We become more and more holy. And so what that means is little by little, we are being moved out of the world, less of the world, and more of heaven, more of God. We are being sanctified little by little. God is at work in us. And through that sanctification, we are changing little by little. It is a process. It changes our thoughts. It changes our behaviors so that we become more and more like God. We never become God, but we act like him in our behaviors, in our word choices, and people begin to see that. Some will like it and some will not like it. That's how that works. And so this is sanctifying grace in action, but we don't fully know what that will look like yet. We know glimpses of it, but we don't know it fully yet, and, and that's okay. When you look at a baby, you think about what they will become. You have dreams and aspirations for that child, but you've got to wait for them to fully grow up to see. And then sometimes you can get a little shocked, can't you? 
We are the children of God. What we will fully be, we don't know yet. But we are becoming little by little. But we won't know fully until we know him fully. And that's what this scripture is talking about. And then it goes on and it says, and all who have this eager expectation of seeing Christ will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. You know what, that is so important because part of sanctifying grace means that we desire to sin less. We don't become sinless because our sins have already been forgiven, but hopefully we are sinning less and less. Because do you know you can overcome sin? You can. Through the power of Jesus, you can overcome sin. The problem is most of us haven't fully tapped into that. And we still sin a little. And that doesn't always make sense because hear these next words in the scripture. Anyone who sins is breaking God's law for all sin is contrary to the law of God. And you know that Jesus came to take away our sins and there is no sin in him. Anyone who continues to live in him will not sin. Ouch. Anyone want to claim that they've already sinned this morning? Yeah, nobody wants to claim that, do you? But that's our reality sometimes, isn't it? And so if this scripture is saying that those who live in Christ don't sin anymore, well, what does that mean? Does that mean we're all in trouble? <laughs> Not exactly. What that talks about is it talks about a lifestyle of sin. When you're okay just to go out and sin. Have you ever heard the phrase that simply says, oh, it's all right, I know Jesus, I can do anything? Because it's already forgiven, right? We call that cheap grace. I don't like cheap grace. I don't believe in cheap grace. Because grace cost everything. There was nothing cheap in it. And if that grace is at work in me, and I am becoming more and more of who God is, then that means I should be sinning less. It's my desire to sin less. I don't want to just run out and sin anymore. I'm not saying I ever wanted to do it that way, but you know what I mean. Hopefully, the more I'm learning about God and the more I'm learning about love, the more I'm reflecting that love. Hopefully, I'm less judgmental than I ever have been. Hopefully, I want to do my best to love others, the ones I agree with and the ones I don't agree with. I want to be the same in every single place, in every single situation. I want to honor God in every place and in every relationship. And the more I want to do that, the more, or I should say, the less I will sin. Now, I'm still going to mess up. Why? Because I'm still Karen. And Karen is good at messing up sometimes. I'm human. And we as humans, we still sin sometimes. But when I do, it's how I react. If when I sin, I just look at it and I go, oh, I just did it again. I guess there's nothing I can do about it. I'm just going to continue. Then that might be a problem. But when that sin is brought to my attention, if I'm like, oh, Lord, forgive me. I know I can do better. Lord, empower me to, to not sin that way again. When I find the sin repulsive in my life, well, then I know that God is at work. And then I want to do the work that I need to do to make sure that sin doesn't happen. And let me tell you, sometimes there is work involved. Because sometimes it is not easy to stay away from sin. Because sometimes we need to admit sin can feel good. Sin can fulfill things that, that we can't figure out how to fulfill. It just can feel good. But that does not make it right. And that's why I need the empowerment of God in my life to help me to sin less. To empower me not to sin. To find other ways to live my life that are fulfilling and joyful and honor God. Every Christian is on that path. You are on that path. If you are the same right now in your life as you were five years ago, if you haven't grown in grace at all, there might be a problem. Now I have to say might be. Because maybe five years ago, you already hit 
the top level, whatever that is for you. I don't know. I don't know you enough yet. But what I do know is that when the scripture talks about if we know God, we're not going to sin, well, what that means is that we are growing to become more and more like God, to reflect God more and more. That we will no longer live a lifestyle of sin. We'll no longer be okay with sin in our life. And when we find it, we want to eject it as fast as we can. We want that sanctifying grace to be in our lives so much that we want to become more and more like him. Sanctifying grace is God's love. It's like God's love that says to us, God loves me so much that he doesn't want me to stay the same. He wants me to change more and more to be like him in all of my actions, in everything that I do, to become more like him. And you see, I think that that's what God wants for you too. Because I think that sanctifying grace is at work in your life as well. And I think that that's something that we need to check periodically. Now, I've already told you before that, that I'm a part of a covenant group. That covenant group meets once a month. I'm actually going to meet them this next Wednesday. And when I meet with them, we spend time together and we share life together because I want them to know my life. Because here's the reality. Sometimes sin can enter into my life and I'm not the first one who's aware of that because that's how treacherous sin can be sometimes. And so I need other people in my life who can see into my life, who I'm vulnerable with. And they can say, wait a minute, what's really going on here? It sounds like you're more jealous than anything else here. And I'll go, I'm not jealous. Well, then why did you say this? Oh, maybe I am jealous. Gosh darn it. Maybe I better have an understanding of why I think that way or why I say that or, or what's going on. And so I need people in my life to help me, show me places where I'm not reflecting God so that I can change that and become more like him. And we all need that. That's why we have the church and one another. That's why we need to be in groups where we can be vulnerable, where people know us and we know them. It's not so that we can be critical of them, but it's so that we can hold one another accountable in love with one another, to help one another reflect our heavenly parent, because we are the children of God. We all need that. And so I invite you to check out your own life. Who are the people who are holding you accountable as a child of God? Who are the people who are holding you accountable in how your life is being reflective of who God is? Because remember at the beginning when I told you I went to that family reunion? I believe one day there's going to be an even bigger family reunion and that's going to be in heaven. Wouldn't it be awesome if somebody came up to me and said, oh, wait. You're a child of God, aren't you? By golly, yes, I am. I want people to see that in me. And you know what? I want people to see that in you as well. Because you see, about two and a half months ago, the bishop assigned me here, here, at Trinity on Jackson Street. And guess what? That just put me in your sphere of influence. And that may be a good thing, but that also may be a bad thing. Because I'm here to help you to be a child of God. I'm here to help you to grow into the person that God is calling you to be. I don't want you to be just, I would say a pew sitter, but we don't have pews. I don't want you just to be a chair sitter. I don't want you to be one of those people who comes every Sunday, sits in a, in a chair, and then goes home and just waits until next week. I don't want that to be there for you. If that's what you want to do, if you want to come to church and simply sit in a chair and never change and go home and wait for the next Sunday, then I want to help you to find a new church. Because if you're going to come to Trinity on Jackson, I want you to be the child of God. I want you to reflect the love of God. I want that love of God to be in your life so much that it is overflowing in you into the people around you. I want that extravagant love to pour from you into the lives of others.
And I want that to happen every single day, not just Sunday morning from 9 to 10. Every single day. I want you to be the same person you are on Sunday morning as you are on Sunday afternoon, even when your team is losing the ball game. I want you to be the same person you are on Sunday morning, even on Wednesday when you're out driving and somebody cut you off. Instead of screaming at them, I want you to pray for them. Extravagant love. I want you to be a child of God that the world will say, there is something different about them in the way in which they act, in the words that they choose. So when they come to you and they say, why are you doing this? You can say, I learned that from my parents. God. That's what I want for you. Because it all comes down to this last part. Here's what it says. Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. I want you to be righteous, which means right with God. I want you to be extravagant in your love. I want people to see you as the child of God that God created you to be in everything about you. Because I want this church to become a church that is pouring out the extravagance love of God. And the only way that's going to happen is when it starts with you. So I want you to know this piece of scripture. Because I want you to know and see how much God's love is there for you. Because I know the more you see that, the more it will change you. And the more it changes you, it changes everything. So as we prepare to close today, let me pray for you. Loving and gracious God, I want to pray for everyone in this room and everyone who's watching online because God, I want them to see and to know the depth of your love for them. I want them, Lord, to be changed. I want them to become a reflection even more of you that the whole world sees you in them. And so Father, I pray for people right now who are struggling. I pray for people right now, Father, who, who just really don't feel like they're growing very much in their faith that their faith really isn't changing them much. Father, I pray that in this day they will recommit to you, that in this day, Father, they will decide to spend more time with you, to be in your word, to find a group of people to help them to be changed into the person that you would have them to be. And Father, I pray for the one right now that is still caught in the midst of sin. Maybe it's because they like it. Maybe it's because they don't see a way out. Father, I pray that even in this moment that you will break the bond of sin that holds them in their life, that you will set them free from that sin, that they will find a new way to live, that they will no longer be captive. They can let go of whatever that sin is in their life and they can live a new way by your extravagant love. And Father, I thank you already for the way in which you have broken the sin in their life, that you have set them free. And Father, Help them to see just how much your extravagant love is poured out on them. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.